Hello everyone, this is Dr. Randy Cook with a brief announcement. Today we'll be bringing you an interview that I did with Dr. Lisa Gould that was recorded a few months prior to its release date. During that time, Dr. Gould's father unfortunately passed away, and as you'll hear during our interview, Dr. Gould attributes much of her success to the guidance she received from her dad. So we are honored to dedicate this Prescription for Success podcast with Dr. Lisa Gould to the memory of her father, Willard A. Gould, Jr. Paging Dr. Cook. Paging Dr. Cook. Dr. Cook, you're wanted in the OR. Dr. Cook, you're wanted in the OR. Welcome to the Prescription for Success podcast with your host, Dr. Randy Cook. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Prescription for Success podcast. I'm Dr. Randy Cook, and I'll be your host for the program. Before we meet our guest today, I just want to remind everyone that our podcast is produced with support from MD Coaches a company dedicated to developing and empowering physicians to realize a greater potential and to achieve a greater level of satisfaction in their chosen fields. You can find MD Coaches on the web at mymdcoaches.com. Well, on today's program, we'll be hearing an interview that I did with Dr. Lisa Gould. Dr. Gould is not only a busy plastic surgeon, she is also a passionate researcher with a particular interest in management of difficult wounds, especially pressure ulcers. Currently, she is the Associate Medical Director and Director of Research at South Shore Hospital Center for Wound Healing in Weymouth, Massachusetts. Dr. Gould earned both her MD and PhD degrees in the Medical Scholars Program at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She has been practicing plastic surgery with an emphasis on difficult wounds since 1999. She holds faculty appointments at both the University of South Florida in Tampa and also at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. Dr. Gould is a past president of the Wound Healing Society, and she received the Distinguished Service Award from that organization recently. Currently, she serves on the executive board of the Wound Healing Society as well as the Association for the Advancement of Wound Care. In addition to her professional life, Dr. Gould is a very accomplished sailor, and she loves to spend as much time as she can aboard her sailboat Encore. So now let's hear that interview with Dr. Lisa Gould. And today it is my pleasure to be talking with uh, an old friend of mine, Dr. Lisa Gould, who is a plastic surgeon in addition to board-certified hyperbaric medicine physician and wound care specialist, now practicing in Weymouth, Massachusetts. Lisa, thank you very much for being with us today and welcome to Prescription for Success. It's a pleasure. Happy to be here. Well, let's get right down to business, if you don't mind. You know, one of the the things that's really fun about doing a uh, an interview program is that I get to poke around in the lives of people in a way that hopefully is not considered to be creepy, but I always learn interesting things about people that I never suspected. And uh, one of the things that I learned about you is uh, in your undergraduate years, you started at uh, Knox College in uh, Galesburg, Illinois in 1977 finished with a Bachelor of Arts in 1981, uh, and you had a major in both Russian and chemistry. Is that right? That's true. So all this- You really did some digging. All all this time I've known you, and I had no idea that you were a Russian speaker. Yes, I wanted to be a spy. Uh, (laughs) That's true. That was my goal. Uh, (laughs) You're you're serious about that. You really wanted to be a spy. No, that's why, that's why I, I was originally, I did it because I was going to be a chemist um, and you needed either Russian or German um, in order to get your certification in chemistry. And then as I got into it, I thought, well, I'd actually kind of like to work for the CIA. 
Um, but at that time, things were quite quiet and it looked kind of boring. And so I decided that I wasn't going to be a spy and I would pursue science instead. <laughs> so actually, at the time that you started undergraduate school, um, medical school was not really in the plan. Is that right? That's correct. I, wow. I was originally going to go to Georgia Tech. I would have had a full scholarship um, in chemistry, um, but I was afraid of the size, and so I stayed closer to home with a small liberal arts school, which I'm pretty happy for. I, I actually advise people to get a liberal arts education, especially if they're going into medicine, because it's about the last time you can touch that sort of thing and expand your mind and read things that you might not otherwise read. It is indeed, and... Uh... Uh, I also happened to learn in my research that Knox College was on uh, Lauren Pope's list of colleges that change lives. Wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> do you feel Do you feel like Knox College changed your life? Well, I'm sure it did. Um, there were some opportunities. Well, certainly being a Russian major was an opportunity that I um, would not otherwise have had. I had a fabulous professor. Um, and Vasily Fyodorov and was uh, quite an impact on me. But also, we didn't have research there. We didn't have, you know, it wasn't a, a university, it's a college. So I had the opportunity to, to go to Oak Ridge National Laboratory um, to find out what research was. I actually thought I was going to hate it. <laughs> and uh, I did research on DNA synthesis and fidelity and the impact of um, uh, divalent cations on DNA synthesis. And I was never going to do that for my life. But while I was there was when you had to apply to medical school or something else. And um, that's when I decided to do an MD-PhD. I was in a house with um, two other guys because we all came from different places and we, we just kind of rented houses. And they were all going to be straight PhDs, and I'm trying to fill out the application. And I said, I don't know what, you know, I like them both. I actually really like this research stuff. And they said, oh, just check the box. And so I checked the <laughs> box for MD, PhD. <laughs> there I went. <laughs> so that was, um, you know, that was a big change. And if I hadn't been at Knox and had the opportunity to go to Oak Ridge National Lab, it probably never would have happened. Well, I, I have to say that uh, that really is a significant surprise to me because when I look at your body of work, it is so vast, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, but uh, you do have a vast body of work, uh, and I would have pictured you as somebody who is very deliberate and has a plan for everything, and uh, just the notion that uh, you decided to go to medical school kind of on a roll of the dice uh, is quite a surprise to me. That's, that's, that's really interesting information. I was also lucky to get in, but the combination, um, well, yeah, so the MD-PhD later opened up a lot of doors, but um, kind of lucky to get into medical school as it was. I, uh, that, that happened at University of Illinois, and it was, it, it, and from the outset, it was an MD, MD-PhD program, is that correct? Correct, right? yeah. It's the Medical Scholars Program, which is fairly unique. Um, it was a true combination of an MD and a PhD, wouldn't cut corners. Um, at the time that I enrolled, it was still pretty new. Um, we couldn't test out of anything. It just everybody did the full course. So there were some PhDs that took a really, really, really long time. Um, but the interesting thing about University of Illinois is uh, it was a big engineering um, university. So we had people that were doing PhDs in engineering, uh, ceramic engineering, which I think has great applications for um, orthopedic surgeons. We had MDJDs, um, people doing uh, art PhDs, just a, a wide variety of things. And we were, we were allowed to do that. Um, and it was, I, I did kind of the traditional uh, science-y type um, PhD, but um, it's still, it, it um, allowed us to interact with people that um, took some different pathways, which was quite interesting. Sounds like you were hanging around with some fairly brilliant people. Mm, yeah, probably. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, it was good. It's become a bit more traditional as time goes on. That's what happens with new programs. But um, And by more traditional, you mean in what way? Um you know, science PhDs and, and not so many of the physics or, um, 
you know, may, I think the MDJD may still be there, but um, the, one of the problems was that if you were doing a PhD, especially in physics, they had a problem where they um, didn't have a limit. So they might be there nine years doing their PhD, which really wasn't the goal of the program. So they, they had to do some other things where they would put them at some the number of years and even testing out, but um, try to get people to have some way that they could then get on with their career. And in fact, you were there quite a while. You were uh, eight years, I think, at uh, University of Illinois. Right, right. And then uh, you moved on to residency in Richmond at Medical College of Virginia. How, how What was the connection there? Well, by then, the way we did our um, combined program is we truly combined it. So when we so we did the first year, first couple of years of med school and try to integrate that with some of the PhD work and then doing some clerkships before we went back into the lab. So I did three clerkships. I did they advised you do some hard ones. So I did surgery and internal medicine. And I think OBGYN. Um, and I loved surgery. And so at that point, I was like, well, I got to figure out what I'm going to do. And once again, what do you, what do you, if, if I can interrupt you, what do you, what do you think was the appeal uh, with respect to surgery? Well, I, I really liked procedures. And what I realized was I really liked closing things up and making them tidy. Um, which is why I started thinking about plastic surgery, because that was the part that I felt the best about. I was like, oh, now everything's nice and neat. <laughs> and um, so then I was trying to figure out how I would combine the two. Um, and at that time, the growth factors had just been cloned. Um, that was back in the day when you could get a PhD for cloning a gene, which um, you probably can't anymore. But um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I said, wow, that would be great. I could combine research on um, the growth factors and skin and be a plastic surgeon and work part time. <laughs> and I'll be living the dream. And um, so that's the path I chose. And that's, I kind of doggedly pursued it from there. Once again, I have to say, I didn't have a whole lot of advising going on here. Um, but uh, it um, it made sense to me, and it really gave me a nice path. And so then when I was looking for residencies, I knew I wanted to do plastics, and so I had advice from um, some of my mentors that there were several places that I should go um, and interview. And I, I had already done a clerkship in Galveston and worked with Marty Robson because um, he was one of the people they said I needed to meet. Um, they suggested Brown, and because I was from the Midwest and from Illinois, I was f afraid of the East Coast, so I didn't think I would go to Brown. Um, <laughs> <laughs> look where I am now. Right? This is quite a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so then I interviewed at, um, in, at Medical College of Virginia because they said I needed to meet Cal Cohen. And, uh, so, and, and I also interviewed at um, Pittsburgh. And I really had a hard time deciding between Pittsburgh and uh, MCV. I just, it was the toss of the coin. And then when the match came through and I got MCV, I said, well, okay, that's the way it should be. Um, but that's how I ended up at uh, Medical College of Virginia was really because of knowing that I wanted to do plastics and I still had to do general surgery, but um, I needed to um, be, to meet Kel Conlon and work in the lab. And that was, that was the goal. And so you 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 completed the uh, five years of general surgery, uh, and did you also take the general surgery boards, or did you have to take the general surgery boards in order to qualify for plastic surgery? No, actually, I was going to be the guinea pig for uh, the first shortened program at MCB because in those th days they didn't have an integrated program for plastics, and they were looking at that possibility. So when they brought me on, the original goal was that I might even do um, three years of general surgery and then go into plastics. Um, they needed me for the fourth year because they needed a warm body. So I had to <laughs> do my fourth year of general surgery. But then they didn't need me for a chief year. 
And so I went, I didn't do a chief year. Um, so I'm not boarded in general surgery. And I went to um, a two year, stayed there for two years of the plastics program. And in those days, it was called a fellowship because it was beyond it was general surgery um, training. So um, what was it like uh, training with other plastic surgeons? Were you, I don't know what term to use, were you, were you considered to be uh, unusual because you were not planning a career in cosmetic surgery? Well, I didn't know then. Uh, you never know what you're going to do. But I knew I had already done two years in the research laboratory with uh, Cal Cullen. We did that during our general surgery time. Um, so it was pretty, by then I had said, I'm going to do research in chronic wounds. We started out doing research in um, fetal wound healing. Um, but I felt that chronic wounds was the more um, clinically relevant problem. And so I said, this is what I'm going to do. I, I liked all of plastic surgery. Um, so we get, got well-trained in everything. So that was um, not a foregone conclusion whether I would be doing cosmetic surgery or not. We didn't get much exposure. In those days, the, um, the route to cosmetic surgery was that you did, you might have practiced for many years and just general plastic surgery. And then as your hair got gray, you did cosmetic surgery. That's hmm, not true that's anymore. <laughs> but it's changed a yes, lot, hasn't yeah, it? Out of the box now, um, people are doing cosmetic surgery. But um, I remember my last couple cases. I there were only there were two residents each year, and my co-resident and I had never gotten to operate together because we were always on different rotations. And but we did have kind of a, a resident program where people could come and get cosmetic surgery that was a little less expensive. And so he and I booked two uh, rhinoplasties and got to do them together. And it was a blast. I was like, wow, this is the first time we've been able to do this. And did, did you ever consider that that was going to be the career, that you would just stop right there and go into private practice? Or did you have uh, uh, academics on your radar screen from the beginning? I don't have a private practice bone in my body. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll come back to that in a minute. I have some other questions that I want to ask you about that. But uh, okay. in any case, uh, uh, once you finished your plastics training, it didn't actually stop there, right? There was a hand fellowship involved as well. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, more training is always better. So I, during my last six months of plastic surgery, I was realizing of my residency, I was realizing that hand is a, is a relatively large part of plastic surgery. And I knew I wanted to go into academics at that point. And I would be teaching residents. And I felt like my plastic surgery uh, mentors didn't really know how to teach hand surgery and that I wasn't comfortable with it. So I went out of the match because it was too late by then and went looking for a hand fellowship. Can can you talk about that uh, a little bit more? I, I, I know you don't want to uh, cast any aspersions or seem ungrateful, but uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about what you thought you were not getting uh, with respect to hand surgery and the plastic mm. program. Well, hand surgery is kind of interesting in that it is um, both orthopedic surgery. You can go come to it from several routes. Orthopedic surgery is a common route. Plastic surgery is common even general surgery, but it's more common either plastics or, or ortho. And I just felt that nobody could really teach me how to put a plate on. I got better training from the orthopedic surgeons than I did from my plastics um, colleagues. It's just not, I think for them, it wasn't a big interest of theirs, but I liked it. I, I thought that hand was really important. And then when I did the fellowship, I really got to love it. Um, it's very nice and meticulous and um, you can really help somebody with it. Plus, the fellowship that I landed in was um, really, it was heavily combined with microsurgery. The, the guys at uh, Milwaukee are um, well known as being kind of pioneers in the field in the 70s. So the sky was the limit for them in terms of doing all sorts of innovative flaps and lots of replants. So got lots of training there. So at that point, uh, in addition to sort of augmenting your training, uh, that was your first faculty appointment, was it not? 
at at Wisconsin. Correct. Yes. I stayed in Milwaukee for three years. So I, um, I just, I really liked it there in terms of what we got to do. And um, we had a very robust hand program. Uh, it was amazing um, that they had built with um, 11 hand therapists, and lots of workman's comp cases, um, and lots of referrals, referrals from the uh, UP in Michigan. Um, when I would be on call, I was like, why are they sending us patients from Michigan? We're in Wisconsin. And somebody said, look at the map. <laughs> it's much closer. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, I know the feeling. Uh, I, I, we uh, uh, Just to throw in a little personal information about myself, I did my general surgery training in Augusta, Georgia, mm-hmm. which sits right on the Savannah River uh, at the border with South Carolina. So I would say a good 30%. Uh, of our patients came from South Carolina, South Carolina. So uh, I, under, I understand where that comes from. So um, at some point, um, you decide to make the move to Galveston, Texas. Uh, and, and to me, uh, for a Midwesterner, uh, it sounds to me like that would be even more intimidating than moving to the East Coast. Uh, but apparently it was not a problem for you. Tell us that story. Well, it was a bit of a problem. So I had been in Galveston as a medical student. Um, I went there for uh, a month to work with Marty Robson. And when I got there, I arrived the same day Hurricane Jerry did. Um, I crossed the causeway and then they closed it. So I couldn't get back (laughs) off the island (laughs) and everything was shut down. And, um, you know, I just hunkered down until the storm passed and then went out to see what was around. And then I did my month in Galveston. And at that time, I said, this is a horrible place. Um, it's an island under concrete. I see it, it just has no redeeming values. So I was in Milwaukee um, actually meeting with um, my research team. And there was a knock on the door from my secretary that said, um, there's someone named Linda Phillips that wants to talk to you. I said, oh, okay. If Linda Phillips is calling, I'll talk to her. And uh, Linda Phillips was the chair of plastics in Galveston. And she said, I think I have an opportunity that you might want to take a look at. And then I said, no, I don't want to live in Galveston, um, but I'll come look. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't hurt to look. And the opportunity was for me to take over what was Marty Robinson's laboratory um, wow. and run that and um, be on faculty in Galveston. And it turned out to be a, a really, really good opportunity, you know, something I couldn't pass up. So, And the guys in Milwaukee said, oh, we knew you weren't going to stay here. Anymore. So <laughs> they, weren't, they really weren't <laughs> too surprised. And so I made it through three years of the uh, um, cold and snow and then moved to Galveston, which is much warmer. Um, Indeed it is. <laughs> now, uh, is, is that the period in your life when you developed an interest in sailing, or is that something that you've always done? I sail, started sailing when I was about eight years old. I see. So I, um, my dad and So I, Galveston was not all to be, altogether a bad place to No, be. it was a great place. <laughs> I was already racing when I was in Milwaukee. I, um, so when I started sailing... It was with my family, and we didn't race. And then when I went to University of Illinois, I said, you know, I had spent the summer in Chicago, and I started racing up there. And I said, if I am going to go to a place that's landlocked, I'm going to have to figure out how to do something. So I learned how to windsurf, and we did that down at University of Illinois. And then when I went to, so from there I went to Virginia, I didn't sail much. I ended up buying a boat, but I did race a little bit. I raced on a hobby cat um, and I raced um, flying scots there. And then when I went to Milwaukee, the first year I didn't sail, but I looked longingly out at the lake and said, how can I get involved here? But I still, I took my boards and that kind of thing. But then I got involved and I raced every Wednesday night and every weekend. Um, even while I was studying for the boards because I could get up early and get some studying and, and go race. Um, and so then when I moved to Galveston, I um, I actually called ahead um, to find out what boat I could get on in Houston. So 
that was it. I just everywhere I go, I try to find a boat to get on. Sounds like a good place for you. Uh, a really outstanding ac- academic opportunity, and uh, and also a good place to find recreation when you needed it. It was. That's also where I met. So my you husband. had uh, how convenient. <laughs> About six years in Galveston, and then there is another move to the University of South Florida. How did that come about? So those of us who are trying to do research are often chasing the Holy Grail of funding. Um, In Galveston, the Holy Grail of funding was Shriners money. Um, And I was having a hard time fitting in with their research um, priorities. Because I was looking at chronic wounds and they're very interested in burns and I just, we just didn't meld in terms of um, how I could incorporate my research into what they were doing. So I wasn't getting a Shriners grant. And uh, I had a career development award in uh, aging. So that was some funding for the lab. But then I got another unsolicited call um, from David Smith in Tampa and he said, I have an opportunity you might want to look at. So, well, this usually works out, so I'll go look. Um, mm-hmm. and, and by that time, you were uh, you really had a significant body of published work, so it's, it's not really a surprise to me that you were uh, on people's radar screens. Yeah. But, but that turned out to be a good one for you, obviously. Yeah. So he wanted me to run the program at the VA, which is another part of funding for research. Um, and he had not yet set up the residency program at the VA. And so really that was my task is establish a laboratory and get the residents, the plastic surgery residents into the VA and uh, set that up. So that was a really, really nice opportunity. And I like Tampa. You know, so I live basically in the tropics for about 11 years. Yeah. Uh, Another very good place for a sailor to be. Oh, yes. (laughs) I should think. Very good. The dolphins would swim with you. (laughs) Um, Lots of, you can, we sailed year round, which was really nice. And it was very pretty. Um, The winds weren't great, but but I had some some fun sailing there. But then, Another opportunity came along, and was this the same sort of thing? Some somebody, uh, uh, somebody in the Northeast was casting about for uh, a brilliant researcher, and you decided to pick up and go because this was really different. This was uh, this next move was uh, a transition into private practice, which is something that you had not done before, right? Yeah, that's correct. No, this time it was me casting about. Uh-huh. Uh, so the. The funding from the VA um, dried up, and it was becoming clear that to be a, a successful researcher, even in the VA, you're going to have to do it full time. And as a clinician, you know, the clinic stuff comes first, and I was really um, having a hard time being able to do everything. Um, and so when I didn't have funding and I had to let people go on the lab, so there's really nothing here to keep me in Tampa. Um, I love, I, one of the things I loved most about my work in Tampa at the VA was the spinal cord unit. And I was pretty much the plastic surgeon for the spinal cord unit. And we have a hundred bed spinal cord unit there. So I learned a lot. Um, but I also had asked the VA to set up a wound clinic. And I thought that it made sense to me that the VA would have a wound clinic. And they just couldn't wrap their heads around that. Um, and so I started casting a net to say, is there an existing wound clinic um, that I could be part of and do some research? Pretty much every place I'd been, I had suggested that they needed a wound clinic. I suggested it in Milwaukee, and they got one after I left. I suggested it in Galveston, and they got one after I left. So maybe the VA has one now. Um, (laughs) um, So I looked around, and um, I knew um, somebody in Rhode Island, who was very interested in research. And um, he said that that would be a possibility, even though it was a private practice, it was a private hospital. Um, I thought, well, this would be interesting to uh, be in a wound center and be able to do the research in the wound center. By then, I had decided that writing grants 
um, is very frustrating. You spend a lot of time doing it, and then you may not have anything to show for it when the grant gets rejected. And if you're not doing it full time, it's really hard to dust those off and, and recirculate them and then ultimately get funding. So I decided I would be better as a clinical collaborator and be able to provide some tissues and insight into the clinical research. Um, so that's kind of how I made that move to uh, make myself valuable in the room center. And then I went up to uh, Kent Hospital in the and were you all were you uh, involved with teaching at that point? Did you have residents and medical students and, and yeah? So, so in, in Tampa, I did. I you know I had the residency program, and I was teaching a lot of people in the spinal cord unit. We did combined um, rounds in the spinal cord unit where we were teaching everybody, which was really fun. So when I went up to Kent, I helped establish a connection with the Brown. University um, residents and fellows. So we set up, or I set up the program to teach the first the family medicine residents. And then after that, um, because of my interest in older adults and because most of the people in the room center are older adults, I um, made a connection with the geriatric um, department and uh, was teaching the Jerry fellows as well, which is really nice because the, the family medicine residents would come. Uh, one day a week for four weeks in a row, and then but the Jerry fellows would come one day a week for eight weeks in a row. So they actually got to see some results and see that people can heal, and they're the front line. And so it was really really gratifying to be able to to work with them. Definitely, I I I, I got to think that that must have been a really valuable experience for the geriatric fellows because. Um, as you say, it's kind of unusual uh, in that type of training to really get up close and personal with uh, a really common problem in the geriatric population, as you know. Yeah, it is. And that helped establish some of the things that we've done nationally, um, kind of getting that connection with the American Geriatric Society and doing some of the teaching that we've done nationally. We also had a required clerkship for the medical students that was a combination of geriatrics, uh, palliative medicine, and room care. Yeah, kind of unique, but it, was, it was worked really well, and the students liked it. Um, we, the Brown University also has what they call a doctoring program, which is for the first and second years. And so I was a mentor for a couple of the doctoring students, and they would come to the wound center. Obviously, they'd never seen wounds. They're sometimes picking people up off the floor, but that's okay. They get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, then it came time for uh, one last move. I'll let you go ahead and give us the details of uh, what brought that on and where you are now. Well, again, I was finding I really wasn't able to get the research done that I was interested in at the smaller small hospital that I was at in Rhode Island. Um, there was a bit of lip service, but the administration, they didn't have the, um, the infrastructure that was needed in order to really do research. Um, and so I um, started looking around what might be close or reasonable. And um, I knew Gary Gibbons from our national work with the Wound Healing Society and the Association for Advancement of Wound Care and asked him, him started kind of having a long conversation with him about whether there would be a role for me in his wound center, which is quite large. And it was over a year process, but uh, eventually he said, yes, we do have something here. Um, and I could go there as the associate medical director, but really help establish the research program there. He was so clinically busy and, and still is. Everybody's still out, full out, you know, taking care of the patients that it's really hard to do the clinical research and get that done because that's very meticulous. So that was really my task was to uh, set that up. I brought with me my collaboration from the University of South Florida, so still being a clinical collaborator for some basic science. Um, but since then, uh, being at Weymouth at South Shore Hospital, have um, 
been getting the startup going and now have been two, no, three um, clinical trials uh, actively enrolling, two in the pipeline and another one in the real early stages. So still continuing the research um, and also acting as a collaborator with two basic scientists as well as an advisor for some smaller companies that are interest, have some very interesting things that might come to fruition for wound care. So I guess I could, you could say I'm living the dream, even though I don't have my own research laboratory. I have a living laboratory with all these patients. Um, so in our wound center, we see an average of 100 patients a day. I've been there for three years. When I first got there, the average was 80, but now it's 100. Um, it's very heavy in the uh, podiatric wounds, but that's because we have four podiatrists. So I don't see those patients most of the time. I may help with some, but um, we have such experts that I don't need to do that. My expertise is still in pressure ulcers, um, in some of the lower extremity wounds, and really, really older adults. Um, I have done skin grafts in the past two months on two 97-year-olds. Um, and they are super healers. I really want to study them to find out what's different about them. <laughs> Anybody that makes it to 97 and is up walking around, they're, they're a different kind of person than what we usually take care of. So, and that's kind of where some of the research ideas are coming from, is we should be looking at people who don't get wounds or people that are different than um, our typical chronic wound patient and clone their genes. Well, I have to say, it really does sound like you're in exactly the right place. You finally have uh, your dedicated wound center and you have lots of research opportunities and uh, perhaps more importantly than anything else, you really have a good bit of support from your direct supervisor. And I, that's kind of unusual. Uh, in our world. And I'm still doing plastic surgery, although it's a different kind of plastic surgery. Um, well, it's not the glamorous, you know, when you, when you mention plastic surgery to people, they have a picture in their mind of what that is. And so mine is more debriding and knowing when and when to debride and when not to debride, um, doing some flaps and doing a lot of skin grafts. Um, But, um, None of the, not the reconstruction that I used to do. I'm not doing breast surgery, um, but I use that knowledge. I'm not doing hand surgery, but I use that knowledge too. Um, so every now and then something comes up that's uh, a little different. And uh, I've already had s- such a wealth of training um, that I can figure it out. I also have to say that my time at MCV, because it was a very, very big trauma center, and um, now, you know, the traumas that we see, they're, they're not huge, but I'm so used to that kind of approach um, that it doesn't put any fear into my heart. I feel very comfortable taking care of anything that comes to my way. Well, it really sounds like you're in a, a, a really good place to uh, make the best of um, all of the experience that you have accumulated over a lot of years. And uh, I was mentioning uh, uh, Back at the beginning of the interview, the um, substantial body of work that you've produced uh, uh, at last count, uh, which I think these were counted in June of this year, you had uh, 51 original publications in peer-reviewed journals, 13 other peer-reviewed publications, uh, five books and or book chapters, uh, three non-peer-reviewed publications, uh, 16 grants completed. Uh, you, you indicated that writing grants was uh, not your favorite occupation, but you must have been pretty good at it. Uh, and in addition to that, you, you still have a significant teaching role, which I'm sure is gratifying for you. Uh, that makes you a, a really uh, busy person, uh, invited presentations, too numerous to count. Uh, all this, uh, plus your uh, uh, membership in several specialty societies and contributions that you make on uh, the boards and governing bodies of all those organizations, uh, and you still seem to find time to sail. That's pretty good. 
that sounds that sounds really good. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I work hard. Um, I'm fortunate to have a very supportive husband. I don't have children, um, so that uh, is, that would have been a huge time commitment. I mean, it does change people's career and it changes their focus. So I have devoted myself to my career pretty much, I have to say. Well, it has been uh, a, a very successful career indeed. And with that, that brings us to the point in the program that I really like the most, I think. Uh, and that is when we invite our guests to give us their own personal prescription for success. So I'm going to sit quietly for a few minutes and Dr. Lisa Gould will give us her prescription for success. I have kind of three bullet points in this prescription for success, and it's uh, pretty much how I started out. Number one is don't let others tell you you can't do it. Um, When I was a 4 -er, H'er, I did receive the I Dare You Award, and there's a little book that goes with it um, that dares you to do lots of things. Um, And I guess I probably took that to heart. More contemporaneously, there's a relatively new movie out called Maiden, and it's the story of Tracy Edwards, who was a female sailor, who really didn't take no for an answer. She wanted to sail around the world, and she wanted to uh, race around the world. And at that time, um, no women did that. They might get on board as cook. And she did get on board as cook, and then she said, no, I'm going to do this. And she put together a campaign, and she got some women together, and they got funding. They had to use a used boat, um, but they did very, very well. And I encourage anybody to watch it. Um, not, I mean, the sailing is wonderful, but the message of don't let things stand in your way. Just go ahead and do it. You know, and let people tell you you can't do it. And that's kind of what I've done. My father was like that. And he, yeah, he did a lot of different jobs, and I saw that. And we just kind of figure it out and make it work. Um, the second uh, bullet point would be, again, it comes from my father, but uh, he had a little um, poster over his desk he had a desk. He didn't work at the desk, but he had a desk. And the poster over it said, begin, the rest is easy. And I have used that many times. When I'm trying to write a paper, and I, you know, I keep putting it aside, putting it aside, um, I remember that. And you just start writing, and you just keep writing, and it does get easier. Um, so I've used it when we've had to write protocols. I just recently used it when we were trying to create order sets for the um, hospital. And the nurse that I was working with said, how did you get this done? I said, just begin it. It'll come. And it really worked. Um, and while you're doing that, you have to keep your eye on the ball. Um, you know what your goal is. And so, you again... That's kind of a way to not give up is you know what your end goal is. And so you keep rolling along and you'll get there. And then the third bullet, again, I have to say, comes from my father. If you don't like what you're doing, don't be afraid to change. And I've given that advice to medical students and to residents. Um, I saw people in college that their parents told them they had to be doctors and they really didn't want to. And that's not a good way to live your life. So even if you start out on a career path, and you can see mine has taken many twists and turns, um, I think that it's best to find what really works for you. Because you work so much, and um, we all do, even if we have big priorities with family, one way or another, we have to be working. um, And it's a big part of our life, so we should be happy doing what we're doing. And I, I think that careers have chapters. My career certainly has. I started out thinking I was going to be a famous hand surgeon. Um, I did a lot of breast surgery, and I really liked it. Uh, but as I got more involved in taking care of difficult wounds, I kind of 
not necessarily closed those chapters, but moved on to a different chapter and built on the skills that I had. So uh, I keep moving, and it sounds like I've moved around a lot, but it's always been to try to better myself and to keep adding to my quiver so that I can be better in the end and help more people. There you go. <laughs> well, Lisa, that is uh, some very good advice indeed. Um, I, I, I particularly uh, was glad to see you bring up the Tracy Edwards story. I had a feeling that you would. Uh, <clears throat> I agree with you that it is a, a really good lesson in persistence, which is something that I guess we all need from time to time. Uh, and is, it is a very good story, uh, as yours is a very good story. So I want to say once again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you are a busy individual, and it was so kind of you to take the time to be with us today. We, we thank you very much. And before we go, uh, I want to give you an opportunity to let people know how they can follow you, how they can get in touch with you. Uh, if you want to give us email addresses or um, uh, websites or put in a plug for Wound Healing Society or whatever you want to do, uh, uh, the floor is yours. What would you like to tell us? Okay. Well, I don't have a website. I, and I don't tweet. <laughs> I, I rarely put anything on Facebook. Um, but my um, personal email address is lgould, G O U L D 44, at hotmail.com, which shows you what a dinosaur I am. Um, and then um, you can find out a lot about what motivates me by going to the Wound Healing Society website, which is woundheal.org. Um, that is, has been a big part of my life. I joined the Wound Healing Society in 1996 and when I was still a resident and recognized that it was a relatively small society, academically oriented, and yet something that I could have a really good networking in and they would help me grow. And so I just have to give a shout out to that society. Um, I recently was given the Distinguished Service Award, which was um, just the top to my career. I never thought I would get that, um, but that Wound Healing Society gave me that in April. And it meant a whole lot to me because that comes from our peers. So um, it's a great society. There's a lot of information, and I think it's growing. Um, in the past year, things have changed a bit, and it's expanding into some of the endeavors that I've always wanted to do, which are more public policy, government relations that we can use to help our patients. Well, I'm going to have to say I can't think of a more uh, deserving recipient of the Wound Healing Society Distinguished Service Award, and I was very happy to see you receive it, uh, and it couldn't have happened to a more deserving person. And once again, Lisa, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, uh, perhaps we'll have you back again sometime soon to talk about uh, what else is happening in uh, your end of the research world. Sounds good. Thank you very much. And that brings us to the close of this episode of Prescription for Success. Remember, you can subscribe to our show and get a little more insight about our guests by reviewing the show notes on our website at rxforsuccesspodcast.com. That's rxforsuccesspodcast.com. Be sure and leave us a comment or ask a question, and I'll be reading those on the air from time to time. And finally, if you'd like to help support the show and gain access to members-only content, you can become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash rx for success podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash rx for success podcast. Thank you so much for listening today, and don't forget to fill your prescription for success with my next episode.